So, good morning, everybody. It's uh, the day after the election, and boy, that was fun, wasn't it? <clears throat> Just so all you know, I am not registered to vote. I unregistered to vote because I'm a, not a United States citizen, peon, a slave. If it ever becomes de jure, maybe then. But also, I operate in the law, and people who operate in the law really aren't supposed to have political opinions, and it's all a farce anyway, but that's a whole other conversation and video. What I wanted to bring forth today is the concept of that the whore of Babylon has fallen. And I'm going to bring forth some documents uh, that kind of prove what I'm talking about here and uh, use some of the information that I've gathered over the years of doing research, just things that sh normally people wouldn't consider are connected, but in the greater picture they are. And the thing that I'm going to bring to the forefront, the first thing is, pardon me, I have some coffee is uh, the history of something that most people don't know about, which is the three sovereigns of China. Now, the three sovereigns of China, or the Chinese emp emp uh, the empire, as in the three sovereigns supposedly gave birth to the five uh, emperors that are now the, that China is now the derivation of that, that they came from these five emperors. Now, the, the story of the three sovereigns of China, and they're called emperors, and also they're also called Augusts. And uh, you'll understand why Augustus Caesar called himself August as soon as I make these very quick connections, because it's not going to be a long video. The person who brought forth this story, the three sovereigns of China, it was brought forth in a, a book called the Shiji, S-H-I-J-I, -I, two words. And it was br brought forth by the author of it is Sima Kian, S I M A Q I A N, I believe. He was born around 145 BC. He was the Chinese grand historian. It was second generation. His father was also one. His father was a little seditious, but the point being is, is he was even actually convicted of treason and made a eunuch uh, rather than face death or buy it off because he wanted to make sure he finished this book. Uh, where he brings forth. Um, the, what he believes is a true uh, history of China, including its philosophical or uh, what would be the mythology of the, fo the founding of the Chinese empire. And it's a 130, page, 130 chapter book on 20,000 slips of bamboo. So it's a pretty extensive book uh, when you consider how many characters they can fit even on a little piece of bamboo. So let me explain the three sovereigns and who they are. According to this history of China, the world was created by the first sovereign, or the first August. His name was Fuji, F-U-X-I, two words. He is a man-faced snake, and he had 12 heads. Uh, in some of his, you know, he can be one-headed dude, but on the whole, he's supposed to be a 12-headed snake uh, uh, lizard deity, okay? He came and divided the heaven and the earth. So he's considered the sovereign of heaven and had dominion over that. He somehow birthed his sister on the question of, it's kind of like Hindu, you're not sure. They have family, they have people. So there are these gods or demigods. And then they birth people and then they create more demigods. But in any case, the second sovereign, his, her name is Nuwa. And N-U-W-A. And she's considered the sovereign of the earth because she came down and supposedly created humanity from the earth. Sound familiar? Took the earth, made humans. She also is depicted, she is actually, two depictions, she's an 11-headed beast uh, that lived 18,000 years. But she's also depicted as a female serpent, a, a, a serpent with a female head. And if you look back in some of the religious texts and derivations, there's some belief that that Nuwa and Fuzi are considered the true Adam and Eve. And, and I'll explain to you why. And then uh, also that she is the depiction of the serpent in the Garden of Eden, because the serpent uh, in a, is a female-headed deity in all the old iconographies, uh, a female-headed faced a human-faced serpent. And when you look at pictures and depictions of Nuwa, which are not very many, she's a woman's head on a, on a snake. And there are some stories related around her mythology about how she created the sky and yada yada. And it's very parallel to the story of Adam and Eve. And 
she supposedly rebuilt the heavens when all these men and demigods that are a little lower than them were running around in war and damaged the pillars of heaven, like war in heaven. So these are all metaphorical things that when you look at them are very similar to our religious tenets, okay? And then there's the last sovereign. So the first sovereign, Fuji, is this considered the sovereign, the August of heaven. The new law is considered the sovereign, the August of the earth. Uh, and then the third one, his name is uh, Shenong. S H E N O N G. Now all of these have other names that they're gone that they go by, much like much mythology. Uh, they may be of a of a heroic kind of construct in the Joseph Campbell sense, and that they may be representations of the same deities in various cultures with different names. But Shenong is only known as Shenong. He's also known as Rehang. I cannot pronounce these words, and I apologize for anyone that can and is and I'm butchering them. It's R E N H U A N G. Now. He is considered the human sovereign, the sovereign of Tia, T-A-I, Tai, I guess. Now, this beast, again a beast, is a seven-headed beast, and he ruled the longest, 45,000 years. He is considered the sovereign of humans, the humans that Nuwa created, Shonong, is the emperor of, the, of and, and he combined he built a united chinese dynasty and supposedly is 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 responsible for the nine provinces of organization and that he in his 45,000 years or at least the dynasty he created supposedly ruled china for 150 generations 45,000 years and again the existing chinese culture and its historic dynastic history is supposed to be created and founded by these three people particularly Shenong. Now, what's important about all this is the way I came to find about the story of the three sovereigns is I was researching symbology and uh, my seal. I have a seal and my seal incorporates the yin-yang symbol. And the yin-yang symbol is actually two um, kanja symbols. And the one of the symbol on the left-hand side is called uh, Sen, okay, and it's literally pronounced Sen, Sen, because in the beginning of it, and it's X I N. Now, the significance of Sen, uh, the symbol, is that when I went to research the symbol in Kanja, okay, uh, it means heart. The word Sen means heart, and it, it, it's a lex, it's an ideographic language, okay, it's one, and it's lexicon. I, I don't know how many characters it has, but ideographic meaning that they are symbols they used to be drawn as symbols like a house started as a house and now it's just a couple lines with a little thing on it which means just uh justice internal internal justice but in any case they are they're they're ideographs that went from true symbols like cavemen would draw to these scratches which we now know as kanja uh you know uh all of the languages that uh, of the Chinese dynasties that look just like craziness to us, but they are rooted in pic pictographs. Now, the pictograph for the symbol Tsen is a penis, and that's you can't really <laughs> just it, you can't argue that it's not. So, in the kanja sense, the word heart is symbolized by a penis. A, a pictograph of a penis, even with sometimes with liquid coming out the head of the penis. And it has now broken itself down into what looks like a tree, kind of. And it's actually the left side of the yin yang symbol if you were to do it in its, its pictographic, ideographic derivation. So the left side being heart, which is a penis. So in the ancient dynastic Chinese language, the penis was considered the heart. Now, how this brings us forward to where we are is the Romans <laughs> and the Knights Templar went to these dynastic regions and Romanja is actually Kanja Romanized. And so you end up with the Roman Catholic Church and the Roman Empire and all these things where their language is based on the pictographs and the ideographs of these cultures that originated you know thousands and tens of thousands of years ago if you were to add them all up and 
just the sovereigns alone rule for over 100, almost 100,000 years, okay? So the Romans learned uh, of their uh, ideographic language and their dynastic heritage and history and actually translated their language to what we use today, Romanja. Uh, the, the Roman, the letters that we use are derivations of Romanja. So Kanja derived Romanja when the Romans translated it so that they could actually take these writings and translate them for the Roman Empire. And strangely enough, from the Roman Empire, after they, you know, kill an, uh, an innocent man, Yeshua, they create this, this book called the Bible that speaks about... Uh, sin and the garden of eden with a female face snake deity so in my opinion if you were to go back and i think that i could probably prove enough or most people would consider it a possibility that some of the stories of the bible are actually brought forth in uh, this book uh called the uh, shiji that uh, sima kwan wrote Qu Kion, I wish I knew how to pronounce his name, but wrote in uh, BC, you know, 100 years, uh, 100, you know, 30 years BC or 100 years BC, and that the Romans brought it forth, having learned about it, going to the Far East and adapted it to their usage in some of the of the more questionable, uh, well, not questionable, but were historically. We just have, you know, the story of the Garden of Eden uh, and uh, Adam and Eve. Well, there's, there's, there's not a, it's just there. And they haven't really brought forth any historical reference where these stories come from. It's just there. And so I believe that a lot of these stories and that uh, Adam and Eve are uh, rooted in these dynastic um, demigods. And I do believe, even just looking at the ideographs and stuff, that the concepts of sin being about the heart and you talk about the, you know, the Garden of Eden, where instead of Adam uh, following the, you know, the, the, the voice in the sky or in his head or wherever it was, he followed his heart. And he, instead of abandoning the woman that he loved, he left with her as she had been cast out from the God, from the serpent on the tree, Nua, uh, who was a bit jealous. And I think Nua could even be Lilith even, but she was jealous of, of, of Eve. And so, um, you know, uh, Adam followed his heart and stayed with the woman that he loved instead of following God in the sky, the authoritarian state. And in a Roman empire sense, that would be a sin, if you understand. So sin is heart. So when you follow your heart, if you go in that lines, you're sinning. And that's completely the opposite of, uh, you know, the true mystical body of Christ, where you're supposed to follow your heart. That's not the sin. The sin is when you don't follow your internal heart that God gave you. So it's also very interesting that if you look at the potential, um, mystical or mythological history of maybe where some of these stories within our Bible came from as they were brought from Kanja and, and all these old dynastic stories that it also brings to light what I want to talk about when it comes to the Whore of Babylon because I think that that's the important part. <clears throat> now, as I've spoken about in my other, in some of my, one of my earlier um, videos, I talk about how the Bible and our foundations to our government and the instruments thereof are rooted in uh, the Bible in the tenets of the common law in the Bible and and I and I actually brought about the concept of the 24 uh, crown sovereigns that are that are discussed in revelations because in my opinion that's a grand jury okay and that's where I believe that the founding fathers got the concept of grand jury so the the 24 elders and golden crowns are, are spoken about in a variety of, of passages and I'm going to read those to you I'm reading from um, not my family Bible. It's a Bible my mother got me. That's the oldest one we could find. It's the Holy Bible. Um, and I believe it's from 1886. And yes, if you're a Mandela observer, the changes are in here too. It's uh, so they, it's amazing. In any case, uh, so 4-4 four, four is the first mention of the elders. And it says here, and round about the throne were four and 20 seats. And upon the seats, I saw four and 20 elders sitting clothed in white raiment and they had on their heads crowns of gold now 
as I've said in, in previous things, I do believe that our founding fathers got the concepts of the 24 of the grand jury from the revelations aspect of it. It's very divine. It's very ordained. And I, it's, it blows your mind. If you, if, if you're running around in my head, you, you would, it, you would, it, your mind would be blown because this stuff just makes complete sense to me when you look at it in a greater construct. Now, 410 says this, the four and 20 elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, thou, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they were, they are and were created. So basically in this section, they're talking about how the 24 elders uh, surrender themselves to the God, the creator of all, not, not demigods. They serve the creator. And that is the purpose of the 24 grand juries. You're supposed to serve the law of God, the God, not these Elohims, the one true creator of all. He, she, uh, father, mother, however you want to do it. Uh, now the next place that they are, that they are mentioned is in five, eight. And <clears throat> that says, and when he had taken the book, because they talk about the book, uh, the throne, the book written within, and the backs off the seven seals, the book that has all the info in it, right? So, and when they had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. So the Lamb hold the mystical body of Christ, if you think about it, in that in that respect. Um, and I'm trans. This is my my interpretation and how I think it all fits into things. And I'm I'm kind of running through this a little quickly because I want to get to the greater part of it. And the next place where the elders are mentioned is in 11:16. And I guess I should go back. First off, chapter four in my book, mine has subheadings, is the vision of the throne. Chapter five is the book with seven seals. Okay, so the seven seals. Is the book that holds everything and and the elders bring it out and they're you know they're using it and then chapter 11 is the witness the two witness of prophecy <clears throat> and they speak um, and I think I might uh, read a portion of this but let me read the section about them which is 1116 and the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God again they worship the true God and um, I want to read you this section because it talks about the prophecy of revelations or what revelations is supposed to be about and the purpose of the 24 elders. So chapter 11, the two witnesses prophecy. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple leave out. It's really important when you think about it and where we're at in law. <sighs> and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. <clears throat> Forty-two months. And it will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. There are two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. So these, you know, these two witnesses... Uh, could be the body of the people who come together witnessing uh, by by witness of two. Remember in the Bible, it brings fact. Okay, and when they shall have finished their testimony, again, he's supposed to leave out. Okay, the temple of God. Uh, that that uh, or excuse me, that he's supposed to leave out the court without the temple. Okay, and we're talking about. For 42 months, two witnesses are going to come in pillars, and they are going to give testimony that uh, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Okay, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. 
And they of the people and kindreds of tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Now, you know, this three bodies laying in the, uh, the, in the street and stuff, I believe this is actually in Mormon prophecy as well. So this is, uh, th this is a parallel in theirs. They say it a little differently, but I believe that I, that I remember reading it as a child. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and, and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered unto them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great, so the witnesses come back to life. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. At the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnants were frightened and gave glory to the God in heaven. The second woe is past. So this is the second woe. And behind the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So, after the ascension of the two witnesses to heaven, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world are joined. Okay? And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, with art and waste, and not waste, wast, wast, W-A-S-T, hmm, and art to come. Because thou hast, forsake, for, hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned. And the nations were angry, and they wrath, and, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest, shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. So he's bringing wrath, and he's going to come back and take care of all the people that are destroying the earth. That's a great thing in my opinion. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testimony. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquakes and great hail. So this talks about that the 24 elders served the purpose in praising the God and, uh, as the witnesses come forth. Again, I believe that they're holding the book of the law and that they bring the witnesses. Now, the next time that it's mentioned, uh, did I do 11.6? Yes, I think I did. Okay, is in 19.4. And 19.4 is the marriage of the Lamb. 19.4. <clears throat> and I want to, this is something I have marked in this section, is section 2. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornications, and has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Okay. So they are mentioned again in this section, talking about how God comes and, and judges them. And sets aside the righteous and uh, cleanses the earth of fornicators and those harming the earth. So 19.4. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God. So the elders are always around whenever God in law or in his word, he in this particular text, come and do corrections of law, leaving out the temples without uh, law. I mean, that's an amazing uh, section right there saying, you know, uh, the court without the temple. Because the court without morality isn't a court in the Bible. And it's not a court in the common law either. A court with no morality that operates solely in, in commerce or for slavery and with Babylonian shackling is not a court. That's why they're called temple courts. A temple court is a real court. It's a court that brings law from the heart, from from what the Romans called sin, from sin, where you go and you judge people's hearts, the sins. So these are, this is a very important part. And then I want to go talk about where the two stories that I'm talking about, about the sovereigns joined together concerning the whore of Babylon. And we'll start in chapter 12, which starts off with this. And the title of chapter 12 is The Great Red Dragon. And this is where it discusses, I believe, well, I'll read it first. It says, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. Now, if you read about Nuwa, she was supposed to be in charge of the movement of the heavens and the sun. Okay, so again, 
the woman who controls the heavens and the sun, and upon her a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, traveling in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared, uh, excuse me, and there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. Funny how the third sovereign, which is the sovereign of humanity, is a seven-headed dragon, and they talk about a seven-headed dragon in Revelations that a woman is going to sit on. And the whore of Babylon, in a lot of people's renditions these days, is Rome. So if you think about Rome is sitting upon the mystical beliefs of this, of the uh, three sovereigns. And by the way, they're called Augusts. The word August was there before Augustus Caesar took the highest title for a man of August. So the, the title August is one of the highest titles in masonry. It's one of the highest titles in the Roman Empire. The August, okay, is the one who can, who, who, uh, collects all the people up much like the five emperors that were uh, or the the august of the of humanity the third august shenong who created the five dynasties and collectivized all of the regions so if you think about it they're portraying an august as someone who who groups everybody up in one unified government okay so that's what the term august comes from in my mind i think they stole it from this text that this guy brought about the the uh, mythological history of china so let me continue reading uh about shenong because to me that seven-headed beast is shenong he's the third sovereign the sovereign of humanity that is a seven-headed beast that reigned for forty-five thousand years and the dynasties that he supposedly created affected the roman empire had a grand effect on their history and culture is rooted if you think about the kanja and all the words and all this dynastic history of them came forth in romanja and their histories and how they translated it now i don't if someone wants to argue with me go right ahead this is my personal belief and i i read all over the place and put big pictures together this is what i do okay so speaking more about shenong and his and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for for to devour her child as soon as it was born roman empire devouring yeshua got it and she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up unto god and to his throne so her child's supposed to have the throne of god these are all metaphorical prophecies okay and the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they would feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days and there was war in heaven Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not neither was their place found any more in heaven the war in heaven we talked about that new law had to fix the pillars for you know the four pillars of masonry and the four pillars of law and there's so many metaphorical parallels with just prophetic things the language in all these collectively so and the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil so shanong becomes the devil after the war and satan which deceiveth the whole world he was cast out unto the earth and his angels were cast out with him and i heard a loud voice saying in heaven now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accusers of our brethren is cast out, which accused them before our God day and night. And they became him by the blood of the lamb. So the believers in Christ are the blood of the lamb, which hold the, the oils of the saints. Remember that. That's from previously. Um, blood of the lamb. And by the word of their testimony again we spoke about how people giving testimony in the two witnesses uh, and they loved not their lives unto the death therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the seal of the sea of the earth and of the sea there's an exclamation point you don't see exclamation points in the bible very often but there's an exclamation point there for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time and when the dragon saw that he was cast under the earth he persecuted the women which brought forth the man-child 
And if you don't believe that right now women are the most persecuted aspect of our society, being beaten and raped, their children stolen from them as they're criminalized, uh, you have religions that think raping women is a right, and men are incredibly misogynistic. The state of affairs is an incredibly woman-hating, anti-family misogynistic society. And if you want to argue with that with me, I, I don't know to tell you because I could tear you apart. Just with basic facts. So while Shannon, the devil, is on the earth, women are, uh, are treated badly and persecuted because they actually create, created Yeshua. And they could bring forth another Yeshua. As Yeshua is one in a million, but one of a million. <coughs> Pardon me for that. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out his mouth, water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away into the flood. So the woman's not afraid of this dude. She gets right in his face. So he starts spitting water out of his mouth. <laughs> These are very funny when you think about them, like if you think about what they're describing. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of the mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnants of her seed which get, which kept the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Okay, so right there you've got Shannon, who's a seven-headed deity who is the potential originating mythological figure of the Roman polytheistic constructs that they've put forth in the Bible and the uh, story of Adam and Eve and, and that stuff. And that the serpent actually create it says in here, creates war. Satan is at war with woman. Not men, not all people. It says in Revelations that Satan went to war with women. And that he tried to cast her away and she got in his face. And so he had to flood her with water. And the earth swallowed her and the water up and protected the woman. So you have the serpent, okay, in heaven seven-headed beast who is cast onto the earth because he loses a war in heaven fighting against the witness of this of the son of christ okay so you have that whole story there let's go to 17 okay 17 is the mystery of babylon and so i'm going to talk about these two i'm going to read 17 and 18 and then i'm going to tell you why i think this is significant okay so chapter 17 is the mystery of Babylon. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, which hold the, the saints stuff. Okay. And talk with me, saying unto me, come hither. I will sow unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away into the spirit under the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. That's Shannon. Okay? That's Satan. That's the seven-headed beast that they described earlier. <clears throat> and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colors. Royalty. Royal colors. And um, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornications. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. All capitals. So, it's a title. <laughs> and I saw a woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which had the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest and is not, and shall ascend into the, onto the, out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose name were not written in the book of life from the foundations of the world, when they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. And so that means the beast is eternal. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. It's, it was, is not, and yet is. So it's there, but it's not, but it is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom, the seven heads or seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. 
And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was, and is not, even he in the eighth, and in the seventh, and the goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, the keepers of the oils of saints. And the lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called the chosen and faithful, mystical body of Christ. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples. So she's sitting in the sea. She's in sea. She's in water. She's ruling the waters. Anyway, so the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and magnitudes and nations and tongues. So she's holding people, magnitudes, nations, and tongues in the sea. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. These are the ten that haven't been given their kingdom. And God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is the great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Now, I've always perceived the whore of Babylon to be D.C. And it is a female construct sitting upon uh, Shannon, which is the Roman civil law, the Satanistic uh, constructs of Roman civil law in Rome, which comes from those uh, Kanja dynastic metaphors. Now, they've completely abused them, but it's still prophetic in a lot of the things. So they're basically saying that this great city, okay, which reigns over the kings of the earth, Washington, D.C., is who the, the whore technically is that is sitting on this Satan that holds everyone at sea. God, you can't make this stuff up, people. You can't make this stuff up. Chapter 18, Babylon's destruction. <clears throat> now, and after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habit habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And so I say to all of you, I'm going to say it right now. Babylon the great is fallen and has become the habitations of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird, I saith. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich to the abundance of her delicacies. Mind you, we're talking about D.C. who sits upon the serpent of Rome in holding people in the sea. Gosh. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sin, and that ye be received not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Iniquity. Inequity. Claims inequity. In admiralty law at sea. For her sins have reached unto heaven, excuse me, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works. Give her twice what she gave. In the cup which she hath filled, fill, her to, fill to her double. How much she hath glorified herself, and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she hath in her heart a sit, sit, a sit, a queen. I sit a queen. And am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore, meaning, sits a woman with no penance. No penance for her deeds. Or at least a female deity, the queen of something. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine. And she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and live deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. 
So how many people watched all the people freaking out last night whenever Hillary, their presumptive little demonic little baby trafficking potential queen didn't get elected oh how did they lament how did they lament mm, the bankers everything rome's burning right now guys rome's burning i assure you standing afar off the fear of her torment saying alas alas the great babylon which mighty city for in one hour is thy judgment come and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore, because they're criminals, they're reprobates, they're evil. Mm -mm. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thy wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of most precious wood and of brass, iron, and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men that's a lot of stuff holds all the silver all the gold all the wood the souls of men the chariots slaves the beast everybody is what this this babylon holds at the sea at the sea in the great city dc ruled by roman civil law from rome and the fruits of thy soul lusted after are departed from thee and all things which are dainty and goodly are departed from thee and thou shalt find them no more at all the merchants of these things which were made rich by them shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment weeping and wailing i hear that hillary was crying last night poor baby Psst. and saying alas alas that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, thanking themselves royal, our kings. In the Civil War, they gave the president the writs of marquis. Mm -mm. That's a king's right. Mm -mm. Not supposed to have kings here. We don't have kings here. We have one king, that king, that king, that queen, that god. We only serve one master here in this country. Not false Elohims that drape themselves in purple and are false kings and queens. So, <sighs> for in one hour so great riches has come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? There is no other. And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, the great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour is she made desolate. They're even talking about the people who serve these people are the keepers of the ships at sea. Seriously, people? Keeping people and vessels at sea? Now, I don't know if you all know this about Roman history, but there was a group, a sect of Pharisees or Jews, quote unquote, called the Sandeen. You know what the Sandeen did? They were the people who shipped slaves for the Romans on ships. That's, you know, they were like the first Roman maritime lender, probably. In any case, she, she ships at sea, holding all the people, holding all the wealth, all the slaves at sea, where this great city's whore operates and sits. <clears throat> and they cast a uh, Oh, sorry, that's rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. <laughs> Brought our vengeance upon her. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall the great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee, and no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee, and the sound of millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee, and the light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee, for thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorcery were all nations deceived." And in her found the blood of prophets and saints and all that were slain upon the earth. Okay. Now, to me, that is describing the constructs that we find ourselves in at law, admiralty law, 
clearly I've tried to annotate it as I've read this and it's basically saying that they have this that the merchants deceived the great men with sorcery and all the nations were deceived with sorcery magis magistrates men who profess to be the keepers of temple courts the Pharisees who stole our temple courts but they're not courts because they don't have a grain of law so the courts without a temple and they derive their power from Roman civil law in a coup from Rome and they sit in DC and up until yesterday their pronounced uh, beneficiary who was going to be their servant to pro to continue this merchandising of men was Miss Hillary Clinton and so I personally believe that what we have just seen is the fall of Babylon in the precepts of revelations and that I believe that it fits everything because it talks about the resurrection of the flesh and you know that I go around telling all of you about that when you you they deem you lost at sea you're dead at sea you're dead to them you're dead in their sea water law construct kept at sea all the slaves all the constructs all the property all the lands at sea held by the whore of Babylon and sitting upon Shenong okay and if you're if you're Chinese and you're offended by my comparing Satan to Shenong hey uh, the Romans kind of used you so I get mad at them so they're sitting on Shenong who's who's Satan the fa the founder of the the sovereign of men who uh, brought forth all of this dynastic control of the controlled earth that was his goal that's what he did in the Chinese Empire this mystical uh, seven-headed beast uh, that's described in Revelations that brought all the men together and that's why he's considered the sovereign of men now of man now I don't know if they if the, if in the translation they mean just men and that's why it's anti-woman I'm not sure but regardless of the fact when you say I'm not dead beyond the sea I'm a spirit and I hold my vessel and I I am the keeper the captain of the vessel of my soul you are effectively resurrecting yourself from the dead in, even in law you're resurrecting yourself in the dead and so people have started the resurrection the resurrection is upon us it is happening right now with everybody who understands the concept of uh, maritime Admiralty prize law and how they think consider us vacant vessels and all these other things when you say I'm not a vacant vessel and I own the vessel of my soul you have resurrected flesh and all you need to do in a spiritual sense because we are in a spiritual war is say as God is my witness I am resurrected in the flesh I am the master I keep my spirit I am the master of self I am the master of this vessel of flesh I am not trapped in the flesh I am of spirit in the flesh and I am free willed by God to sojourn the land in my regal retinue with the nominon I have to affect moral law and commerce and not the kind of moral law people are using in orthodoxy this crazy orthodox stuff these extremes orthodoxy is just state wrapped in spirituality and religion orthodox Muslims that's statism that's fascism orthodox Christianity I'm sorry that's statism that's fascism I think I can prove historically how the Roman Empire and the Roman Catholic Church has been oppressing and committing war and treason and all this stuff against people for thousands of years even before they killed uh, Yeshua okay that's what he was bringing to light so the resurrection is upon us it has been happening the last couple years and we just kill the whore of Babylon okay we just put the whore of Babylon down with this election this selection however it went I don't care how it went I don't know how it went why it went but I do know one thing mr. Trump is not violating the titles of nobility amendment he is a POTUS that actually can operate in de jour so the 24 elders that bring the book and that carry uh, that bring forth the lamb that puts down uh, the Babylon for real uh, by witnesses and with the oils of the Saints that's the last thing we got to do here we do that grand jury we get that federal common law grand jury to go in there 
and bring testimony and witness against all those followers of the whore of Babylon, those who keep us at sea. And we bring those kings and nations that have benefited from our tortures and our slavery, and we bring them down with grand jury uh, presentments and witness and testimony of fact of all of the criminality that the whore of Babylon has been putting upon us. We do that, and you've satisfied revelations, folks. So I'm very happy. I know that some people might freak out, but, you know, I sit and I read philosophy. I read uh, spiritual texts. I read uh, mythology, and I look at how we've all lived here all this time together. So the mythology over here probably matches the mythology over here. And you, if you look at the world in a broader perspective, I do trust that the Bible is a prophetic book in metaphor and, and, and parody and all these other things that, that Jesus speaks in. Parable, metaphor, symbolism. I think it was done in that fashion so that we could apply those metaphors and parables to whatever realm or paradigm that we lived in, that it could be a metaphorical construct and we could see it if we were looking for it and were enlightened enough. So we're one step away, my brothers and sisters. We've done the resurrection. We are in the resurrection of the flesh. Babylon has fallen and we are one step away, the grand jury. It's a good day, brothers and sisters. Peace be with you and all of your relations. Namaste. Namaste, my brothers and sisters.